you look so happy and healthy this morning. Oh, that's I'll good. try. Well, sorry, that's your knee. I don't mean to be bumping knees with you. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paul Goff. So, um, playback. Um, interesting project. It's been going for quite some time, but it's really um, seems like it's got a second wind at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's just gone past a year now that it's been broadcast. And it came about because of changes in my life and to music in general on Radio National. Uh, and APRA AMCOS were concerned about, you know, they obviously support the ABC and what they are doing in aspects of Triple J and Double J, but there is a, a, now a whole where a lot of music was aired, we're talking blues, folk, if you want to use the term more marginalised genres that don't fit into a youth network per se, that they were fearful that it was sort of being sidelined, particularly for a national audience. And while community radio is doing a fantastic job, it allowed for uh, a program that, from someone I guess like myself that's had an experience with networking a program around the country, to have a holistic approach of not just looking at the Eastern Seaboard, but looking at communities right around this country, drawing from that and sharing that music around the country with people that want to know what's going on. They want to be able to, you know, you, you can find an artist in Cairns that might find it hard to tour and you can bring them performing into the homes of someone in Perth, for example. So um, that's the idea. The goal is to highlight the breadth and depth of Australian talent and to, you know, look, look at emerging artists. Because I've been a musical nerd for a long time, I'm able to go back through my memory and collection and say, well, you know what, that's great, but why do you hear this from 1982 that no one remembers anymore, that has a connection? Um, so it's that kind of, you know, it draws on those kind of elements. So it's, it's meant to be something that's fresh, but, you know, looks to the past as well. And I think, as I said, just tries to be quite broad in its representation of what is going on around the country. Now, the partnership with APRA and COS is a nice one to have. It is, because, uh, look, you know, I think the beauty of what they're doing is they really are encouraging musicians as writers to be involved, you know. And this is something there's, you know, still a lot of people that are making music that have no idea that, you know, their music's being played in pubs, in hairdresser salons, in places around, and they can be being remunerated for their skills. So, you know, it's great to be able to, and, you know, because it's um, uh, a co-production with them, you know, I, I will remind musicians about that. Or if I'm talking to a young musician, I'll say, hey, you, are you a member of APRA Angles? And they're, some of the goals that they're, they're looking at at the moment, you know, with things like gender parity, I think are really important. I mean, to be honest, I've never had a problem with, when I've programmed music, I've always actually looked at those kind of things. Am I playing too much white boy indie rock? Am I playing, am I looking at what I'm playing as far as Indigenous content goes? So there, there are things I think as programmers we need to really look at. And so the partnership with them is great because those kind of goals are goals I was interested in anyway, but it's good to be able to do that and to actually thoughtfully curate a program that looks at all those issues. It gives you an opportunity then to talk about the, the artists themselves and look about what's happening behind the scene with some of these emerging artists? Absolutely. I think that one of the things I like to do, and it's not just young people. I spoke to a group called Canyon from Melbourne and they're musicians that have been doing it for a long time. Some of them have been doing more sort of, I guess you would say, and I'm this is from memory, you know, corporate kind of events, but they're still making music. And in what is now more and more a young person's game in the way you use social media and what have you to get your product out there, I listened to their album, for example, and thought this is still a really great album and who's going to play it? So I think that, you know, by and then having an interview and saying, okay, how, how do you tackle this? You know, you, you've made this album and you're certainly going around playing live and giving, you know, people are buying it, but how do you get it out there? Are you satisfied with it just sort of being a very small niche kind of market? So I guess what it's doing is the program allows the artist to, to, to speak, not only from a production point of view, from, you know, I like, I'm always interested in how people write songs, so we talk about that, but just about 
in this day and age of getting your music in out when there is just you know an endless supply of new music coming out. And having CRN as a vehicle to distribute the program? Exactly. So my, my procedure is that each week I send a program, upload it to the CRN, and then they distribute it around the country. So I'm always a couple of weeks ahead. And what I do is, um, because I'm based in Adelaide, and it's not probably, sadly, the, the capital for people coming in on tours, they tend to hit the eastern seaboard, maybe go out by the west. Um, I do what I call my smash and grab rates. I go to Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, if there are other events, occasionally I'll go elsewhere. But I go and I just do, grab a lot of content. So the last, when I went to Big Sound in Brisbane, I did 16 interviews in two days, which that was the biggest test I've had so far. And I was really worried that I was going to get people muddled up. Oh, you released that album, then find Oh, no, you were actually the third person I'm going to talk to. Is that? Um, but, you know, if I go to Melbourne for a couple of days, I'll get at least four or five interviews. And then I'm fortunate because of my background in radio, I have worked on both sides, so I can record sessions, you know, not, not really complicated big bands, but, you know, up to three or four piece bands. And, and I've made good relationships with people in Melbourne and Sydney, so I can use studios there, have a little great little portable recording unit. And yes, yeah, so I get not only the interview, but I'll get a couple of session tracks, which, you know, I think that's the special, that, that's when you have that kind of specialised content, and particularly if you're broadcasting into rural areas, you know, they're getting that unique snapshot of an artist, not only what they're thinking, but how they sound live, which is often very different to the recorded output. Do you see then a take up? Is there a situation where you can say, look, I've, I've had a, a, a band on them and we've done this and they've been a new and emerging artist and I've showcased them. And then you see a take up of that by some of the stations? Or is that hard to measure? I think that's really hard to measure. I think. One of the things I spoke about in, in presenting a music program is keeping your ear to the ground. I mean, not waiting for the content to come to you, but you go looking for it. Um, I'm particularly obsessed with still with cassettes, and there was a young woman this last two years who released her first recording on cassette, and that's what drew my attention to her. And I was lucky enough to have a chat with her, and then, and, and this isn't, but I'm not an egotistical person, so this is not me saying, oh, look at me, but it was a woman called Stella Donnelly who went on to be the Triple J Unearthed winner. And so I had that kind of interview prior leading into that. So I think what I'm saying is it's a matter of looking around, being aware of what people are um, doing, and then, you know, who's to say whether something's going to be successful? I mean, I'll hear things and think, like, for example, at the last big sound, and I, I mean, I was in... I wasn't on my own, there were a lot of people saying this, but I saw this young woman called Carla Geneve, probably one of the great rock and roll performers in the last recent time that I've seen, and I think big things for her will come. Um, and so the way I present, I'm really passionate, and I'll say that. Uh, does that happen? I don't know. It, sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. There are a lot of musicians I've championed over the years that sadly don't seem to... That they all have... It's, it's like the songwriter's songwriter. You know, within the industry, they'll be embraced, but the wider population may not get it. So I, I think, you know, it's important to, to go around and discover and, and do your best to present. And I guess what that then feeds into is it comes down to personal taste, you know? And, and because music is subjective, I might rave about something. It doesn't mean someone else is going to like it. You can only... But then I can only present what I believe to be what, you know, I mean, I'm not, if something is flavour of the month and I don't get it, I'm not going to play it. If we both agree on that, you know, the why, then sure, I'll play it. But So I guess what I'm saying is I think my motive is to find things that I think, for whatever reason, uh, have value and then to try and draw on that, get in touch with them, have them on the program, get them to play, and then maybe find the artist that could have been or should have been and link that into it. You like her, well, you're going to love this. It's, it's that kind of thing. Great. Thanks very much. That's all right.